we, the crypto community, created this narrative that Bitcoin was digital gold and that when a crisis comes, Bitcoin is going to be like gold. Like gold, like a store of value, safe haven. Guess what? In the last month is the first time since 2008 that we've had a real financial crisis. We've got a coronavirus. We've got, um, we've got this oil, oil crisis, if you want to call it. And it's the first time that we've had such a big drop. Markets have dropped 30, 40 percent in some cases. And ironically, in the last month, Bitcoin has been performing exactly like the Dow. Full correlation. Sell off on the Dow, sell off on Bitcoin. Buy on the Dow, buy on Bitcoin. So I think that Bitcoin after this is going to take stock. And then we're going to realize whether or not our thesis that Bitcoin is a non-correlated asset is true and whether, it's a, whether the store of value is, is right. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And we're here live from the Crypto Compare Digital Asset Summit 2020. Tons of amazing talks, tons of amazing people. And speaking of amazing people, we have one of the biggest movers in this space, CNBC Crypto Traders host, creator, CEO of OnChain Capital, Ran Nunier, it's a pleasure to have you, my friend. Thank you did very I much. It correctly? You did, you did. Yes. It's a pleasure to be here. We're not allowed to shake hands here because of the coronavirus. So I guess it's all been bumping and, and, and stuff like that. <laughs> with the feet as well, yeah, right? People are kicking well, each yeah. shoes. <laughs> awesome, man. So uh, first and foremost, you've been a massive mover in this space and people don't realize how important of a role you've played. And I'll, I've been dreaming to ask you this question for a very long time. CNBC used to be kind of bearish on Bitcoin and most of the headlines, not necessarily from CNBC, but from the guests they had, uh, would be negative. It would go crypto bubble, the tulip bubble, on money laundering, drug money, and it was, it was quite negative in, in terms of the ratio. But one day, a man like you came and suddenly there's an entire show, CNBC crypto trader dedicated to crypto. How the hell did you do this? <laughs> I think you give me too much credit. But <laughs> I think you give me too much credit, but I, I'll take you through the life cycle. So I came into the crypto space in around 2015. Um, obviously started buying Bitcoin. I started arbitrage trading Bitcoin because then there were many, many arbitrages. And over time, I realized that there was no good information out there. And I never knew why the coins were moving. So, you know, there was Bitcoin, there was Ethereum, and there was Litecoin. And these things were moving very fast and no one knew why. And uh, for me, the, the tipping point was around consensus in May 2017, when the prices, literally during consensus, we created this thing called the consensus pump, where the prices, the prices doubled and tripled during consensus. And then when I got back to South Africa, I went to one of, a friend of mine who's a director of CNBC. And I said to him, I said, Sid, you should be covering this asset called Bitcoin. And you know, he's like, okay, well, tell me what this Bitcoin thing does and how it works. And we were supposed to meet on something else. But interestingly, we spent our whole meeting talking about blockchain and, and Bitcoin. And I said to him, Sid, you know, what you should do is you should have a show. You should have a show on Bitcoin and crypto. Now, what I meant was, when I said this, what I meant was, I meant they should have a three-minute insert into Power Lunch or one of those things and not a whole show. His response was, you know, I'd go and talk to my head of production, a, a lovely lady named Bronwyn. And, you know, the next day I was in Bronwyn's office and we had whiteboards up. And I was teaching them about Bitcoin and crypto. And I said, guys, I think you should have a show and, and cover it. And she, you know, I could see that she warmed up to the idea of Bitcoin. Once she understood it, she was like, I get this. And when that happened, she said, we have to have a show. She said, look, it has to be a weekly show. It has to be 26 minutes and it has to be live. And I looked at her and I said, look, I was thinking like three minutes. <laughs> and I was thinking like, and she said, no, no, this is big. This has to go. This, is, this has to happen big. 
And so we agreed to do a 26 minute show once a week and we agreed not to do it live because I'd never done TV before. And uh, got into the studio and there I was in front of a camera with my own studio doing cri the crypto trader show. Now, what most people don't see is how much credibility we brought to the space. Mm -hmm. This was the first time that a major network in CNBC Africa, but under the CNBC brand, actually got up and said, crypto is a thing. Mm -hmm. And many other networks in the world started to follow us. I'll never forget that when I created the show, I didn't realize that I was the first in the world. I just did it because it was fun. I sold my previous business. I, I, I promised my wife that I was retiring. And for fun, I thought, let me do the show. What people don't realize is that that was the first time that a big network dipped their, their, their toes into this world of crypto. And then everybody started to follow us. CNN started to follow us. Even CNBC International then started to have much more crypto coverage. And I was a regular guest on, on things like Power Lunch and um, uh, Fast Money and all the other ones. And I mean, yeah, two and a half years later, here we are. Incredible. The first crypto televised channel, credible network. Like you said, CNBC is a big, big network. A lot of people say that, you know, since the show started, even for example, the, the awesome guys at Fast Money, you know, Melissa Lee and the crew, a lot of them became more and more bullish. It seemed like the sentiment changed. Did you feel that as well? Or is that just like a, a thing that we have here in the crypto space that we want to believe based on our bias? One thing you've got to learn about all mainstream media, and I learned this the hard way because I'm not a journalist and I'm not a mainstream media guy. They go where the viewers are. And so I was, you know, when, when crypto was a big thing in 2017, every day there was something on Fast Money, every day there was something on Squawk Box, every day there was something on Power Lunch. We had a show and everybody, every CNBC show had something to do with crypto. So much so that I won't forget the day that I walked into CNBC and there was a big announcement because they now were adding the Bitcoin price to the bottom of the screen. Yeah. But then came the bear market. And when the bear market came, I don't know if you noticed, but nobody spoke yeah, about crypto. The Bitcoin price was removed. And to me, it was like, I had to keep working, keep doing a weekly show, keep working hard. Um, and I was the only guy. And then when the market turned again, well, now you see it all over CNBC again. So remember that the media, the mainstream media really follows the mainstream and the mainstream are following the price action. And that's, it's as simple as that. It's a simple equation. That's really, really interesting. And in terms of making people believe about Bitcoin, like what are some of the first whys that came through your mind and you're like, this is definitely, I know you're a huge fan of store of value and other components, but uh, generally speaking, what was your big why? Bitcoin is a problematic asset. Why do I say that? Because when you're sitting in front of people, and, and they ask you, what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm in cryptocurrency, or I'm in Bitcoin. And they say to you, what's Bitcoin? I dread that question, as I'm sure you do. Yeah. And the reason why you dread the question is because you know that there's no short, easy answer to that. You've got to explain digital le uh, distributed ledger technology. You've got to explain decentralization. And that's like a half an hour discussion. And then fiat currency as well, and, and yeah, the flaws. <laughs> and I mean, you've got to explain all of that. All of that so yeah. I dread that question. And so... I thought that what we needed to do was bring a credible source talking about it every single week. And that's exactly what we did. We, we tried to bring education to the people. What then happened was the core market that was watching the show turned around and said, okay, we know everything. Now take us on a tour. And then we started covering conferences around the world. And every time I went to a conference, I took a whole bunch of cameramen and sound people with me and we started recording my experience and that was again the first time that anybody started to cover conferences and we covered every single conference we'd interview the speakers on the stage and we'd try and bring the conference experience to the viewers at home and that took me on a two-year roadshow of, of all these conferences um i got to meet incredible people i got to have a lot of fun um but it did come at a big price of my family life you know i've got three little kids um i won't forget that when one of my kids was seven days old, he was circumcised and I left the circumcision and I got onto a plane and I came to London Blockchain Week. And that was when my son was seven days old. So it's just pretty wow. taxing. I think a lot of the crypto community don't appreciate how hard we work to get one episode out. I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I mean, you know this because you've got an amazing setup here with cameras and, and, and sound people and light people and whatever else. But, you know, if I want to, create a 26 minute show of Korea blockchain week. It means that I have to arrive in Korea on a Monday, get a good night's sleep because Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we would be sh we'd be shooting. By Thursday afternoon, everything has to be edited. And by Thursday night, it's on TV. 
And then I get home on Friday, or Saturday, or Sunday. And all I did was create 26 minutes of content. Yeah. And not everyone appreciates how hard it is to get the content, let alone find the speakers, get them off the stage, sign the releases, get them to agree to speak. All that was to deliver 26 minutes every week. And that must have been so fascinating. I mean, you met so many influencers and, you know, brilliant minds. Who are some of the people that you felt like you learned so much and it just went to your, in your soul? You're like, this guy is the perfect educator or ambassador. So it's, it's interesting because I, I think I really was in a position where I met everybody in crypto. Yeah. Like, I really think that there's three or four people that I haven't managed to interview yet. One of them is Satoshi. He just won't come on my show. Um, damn. damn, yeah, I keep <laughs> mailing him to the same address where he released the Bitcoin white paper and he never comes on my show. And there are one or two others that for, for political reasons didn't want to be on CNBC or didn't want to come on my show. But I, I did meet a lot of people. Um, very hard to say who the most interesting people were. Um, I guess Brock Pierce was one of the interest, the interesting people that, that I met. I think the guy that I'm most enamored by is Roger, uh, Roger Bear. Mm. To me, I know he's controversial in the space ever since the, the Bitcoin cash uh, BCH slash Bitcoin split. But to me, I don't think there are many people that have done as much for the space as Roger's done. Mm. You know, here you're talking about, you know, I don't know if you've read the, the, the Ben Mesrick book, uh, Bitcoin Billionaires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, here you have a guy who was here from the beginning and he was here really out of ideology. Roger didn't come here for the money, right? Roger came here for the ideology. And he invested pretty much, he, I think he was the first person to invest in a Bitcoin company. And he invested in pretty much everyone. And... I think a lot of the reason why this ecosystem is where it is today is because of Roger. And he continues in his, his approach. I've never seen anything like it. Here's a guy who must be you know, a multimillionaire hundreds of times over. But yet every single person that meets him, the first thing he does is make them download a Bitcoin cash wallet and, and, so and gives them $5 or $10. 15 half to us. <laughs> You know, you've got to admire a guy with that kind of tenacity and that kind of vision. And I've spent a lot of time with him. And the one thing I can say about him is he's single-minded about his ideology and he's single-minded about his vision. Mm. And he, he's one of the, I think he's the person that's probably done more for the space than, than anybody else or mostly more for the space. Um, he also has the, the same ideals that I have about experimentation. So whereas I, I appreciate that, you know, Bitcoin is the best protocol and the, the king at the moment and the most used protocol, I also think that we're very early in blockchain and that we should encourage as much experimentation um, as we possibly can. And I think he shares the same ideals of experimenting and experimenting and experimenting until we get it right. I think it's so true what you're saying, because as we we're talking about earlier and the biggest bull run into 20K, you know, the Japanese yen accounted for more than 50 percent of all the money put into Bitcoin. And he was hustling in those days, meetup after meetup. He does the same thing today. He yeah. does the same. And that's why I say he was fascinating. I think another fascinating ca character for me was CZ. CZ yeah. um, you know, I see CZ as one of the people in the space that built something very quickly. Yeah. And, you know, they say that usually organizations that are built quickly are fragile mm -hmm. but he seems to have built something very solid very quickly and i think that that binance must be a case study in 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 the world not only in the space about a company that can go from x to billions of dollars in a decentralized way pretty quickly um yeah so i think i think cz is also one of those uh one of those people that I'm highly, highly inspired by in the space. The speed of innovation coming from Binance is incredible, right? Mm -hmm. They innovate so quickly. The coin, the BNB coin, I know you were quite bullish back in the days. I don't know if you're still the bullish, chain, but the yeah, coin, yeah, the chain and tons of things. So I really want to ask you- You know, I'm going to say something also controversial. I also think that Justin Sun is, is very important in the space. And I think he's, yes, I know the crypto community have issues with him shilling his coin, et cetera, but let's, and, and, I know the crypto community also have issues with him because he copied Ethereum or he plagiarized Ethereum or whatever you want to, however you want to call it. But Justin is doing things in the space. He's experimenting. He's doing buyouts of, of chains. And this kind of experimentation is, is very important. I also think that Justin really gets one thing. And I'm not sure that the rest of the crypto community get it as well as Justin gets it. 
and I know what I'm saying is extremely controversial, but I think we've got to give the guy credit where it's due. Mm-hmm. Justin understands that in the next wave of blockchain, it's not going to be about technology. Mm-hmm. It's going to be about marketing and adoption. How many developers can you attract to build on your platform? How many users can you attract to use these amazing things that you're building? And Justin gets that. Justin, in my mind, must be one of the best marketers in the world. Yeah, he's a great marketer. Yeah. Yeah. So he may not be the best technologist, or you know, maybe he maybe is a great technologist. I don't know. I don't think he's as, as strong a technologist as Vitalik. But certainly when you look at him from a marketing point of view, he's got that waxed. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, different people in the space for different reasons have inspired me. That's really interesting because a lot of people recently, obviously, he bought Steam, the Steam platform. And Steam, a lot of people are saying that you cannot buy the community. You need to earn them through, you know, great protocols and great technology. But yeah, in terms of marketing, you're right. There's Listen, he tried something. Time will tell if it's successful. Yeah. If it fails, then people will write it off as a failure. If it succeeds, it could be a revolution. So for me, it's not about... I think we're very, very early in the game. Yeah, absolutely. I think as long as your intentions are pure... As long as you're not scamming anyone or stealing from anyone, we've got to try these things. Mm-hmm. And Justin is trying things. You know, he bought BitTorrent. And he, who would have thought to buy BitTorrent? Yeah. But he did it. And he tokenized it. And that's done wonders for the space. Or that is doing wonders for the space. So, yes, I know these figures, some are controversial. Roger's controversial. Even CZ is becoming a little controversial with some people. To me, we've got to encourage people that are in, experimenting, and, experimenting and building in the space. Mm-hmm. And... And so I'm behind all those guys. And not hate as long as they're contributing and experimenting like you're exactly. saying. That's really, and by the way, if you guys agree, disagree, don't forget to put your comments below. More opinions, more perspectives, the better to refine our ideas. Uh, so I have a quick question for you. Like going to the traditional space, obviously CNBC Crypto Trader educated a lot of traditional people and probably has a way better reach than most YouTube crypto influencers for the traditional people. Um, you know, when people say that Bitcoin has zero value, as you know, Warren Buffett was on TV recently. He had, Speaking of Justin's son, they had their dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he was convinced, like, not at all. He said, we had a great talk. Bitcoin does not produce anything. Uh, if you have people like Warren Buffett say those things, what is your kind of line or how do you try to reason them? Look, it's, it's ironic because I'm actually, I'm reading the Warren Buffett, one of his Warren Buffett books now. And what you realize about Warren Buffett's style of investing is that he really only invests in things that he fully understands. And one of the big criticisms that he's got is that he's, he missed the whole Amazon, um, Uber. He missed all of those. And the reason is he didn't understand them. So Warren Buffett understands one thing really, really well, or a few things really, really well, a lot of things really, really well. I'm not sure that he he only invests in those things, and I don't think that he understands it really, really well. With that said, I also think that Bitcoin is now going through an identity crisis. Now, I know, again, this is controversial, but up until now, what we've been saying is we've been saying that Bitcoin is a, is a non-correlated asset. Yeah. We said that Bitcoin is not correlated with traditional markets. But if you think about when Bitcoin was released, Bitcoin was, was created after the 2008 financial crisis. And arguably, let's say that you know, in 2010, Bitcoin started you know, really getting out there, so to speak. Now, since then, we've had a bull market. The S&P and the Dow and equities have been on the world's biggest bull market. And whereas there have been a couple of kinks, the general direction has been up. And at the same time, Bitcoin's general direction has been up. Mm. Now, what we thought was that when financial turmoil hits the world, we thought that the Bitcoin price was going to go up like digital gold. And we, the crypto community, created this narrative that Bitcoin was digital gold and that when a crisis comes, Bitcoin is going to be like gold. Like gold, like a store of value, safe haven. Guess what? In the last month is the first time since 2008 that we've had a real financial crisis. We've got a coronavirus. We've got, um, we've got this oil, oil crisis, if you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And it's the first time that we've had such a big drop. Markets have dropped 30, 40% in some cases. The Dow is probably down 20, 25%. And ironically, in the last month, Bitcoin has been performing exactly like the Dow. Full correlation. Sell off on the Dow, sell off on Bitcoin. Buy on the Dow, buy on Bitcoin. So I think that Bitcoin after this is going to take stock. And then we're going to realize whether or not our thesis that Bitcoin is a non-correlated asset is true and whether it's a, whether the store of value is, is right. Mm-hmm. And I think we'll only know that over time. I don't think that you can measure correlation 
over one over a bull market only you've got to measure correlation over a bull market and a bear market and a neutral market and then decide and then and then we can label it so it still needs to be proven to you it's it's really hard to actually i don't know whether bitcoin is a decentralized store of value whether it's decentralized money um i'm happy to participate in the experiment because i think that it shows a lot of promise but i'm not at a point yet where i can say that i'm convinced that bitcoin is a, di a digital gold i was convinced but having seen the correlations now, I'm like, is it really a digital gold? Because gold is actually counter cyclical at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's been it's been pumping in. Yeah, you're you're right. Many people are starting to question that. My brother had a really interesting point yesterday. He said that by building derivatives, you're getting more institutional players to come in, and that could be dangerous because institutional players are more interested in price action and do not necessarily follow the philosophy of this is you know uncorrelated asymmetric risk return asset as the true believers believe. So do you think it could be dangerous that these guys who focus on the economy and, and price action, they'll short, they'll use derivatives that could hurt Bitcoin and lose that property of store of value eventually? Or is it I too far-fetched? I, I, I agree with your brother that it, Bitcoin is gonna become institutionalized. And when it does become institutionalized, you know, there's gonna be a lot, of, a lot more derivatives, instruments, et cetera. I think we're very far away from that. Very far away. I mean, even if you take the derivatives market on Bitcoin, I don't have the stats on the derivatives market, but it's not big enough for real institutions to be playing in it. So I think we're, we're just tap, scraping the surface. We haven't even started yet. I think the kind of things that people like um, BitMEX and uh, FTX, one of my favorite companies in the space are doing, um, are really important for the maturation of, uh, of the space. And I think it'll take many years. I don't think this is gonna be a two or three year thing. Very interesting. So I just started going back to the, the traditional uh, finance guy who says, oh, Bitcoin is pure, uh, purely a speculative asset, has no intrinsic value or whatever criticism. Ha have you found an angle that makes sense to show them that there is value or do you just give up and just say, all right, I'll talk to you later? Look, no one can argue that it's decentralized value. Bitcoin is decentralized value. It, it, it removes you from the government system. It removes you from the central bank system. No one can argue that. It's performing like a like a correlated asset at the moment, but again, the time the time frame is too long. It's, sorry, it's too short. Let's go back to the the internet days. Let's go back to not very far back. Let's go back to 1998, 99, where you had the internet and you had the dot com boom and then you had the dot com bust. No one knew what we'd use the internet for. We knew that we could send data packets across using email and whatever else. But no one could imagine that we were going to have things like Facebook and Instagram and Tinder. I mean, who would have thought that you'd be dating by swiping? And that's really where we are today with Bitcoin. We're just sending those packets, but instead of packets of data, they're packets of money. And we don't know how we're going to use it yet. We think based on our knowledge of the traditional world that we came from, we're extrapolating some asset, some, some use cases. But I think we haven't even started. I think it's a revolution. You know, there was the internet revolution that led into the social media revolution. I think now we're getting into the, the, the money over data revolution. Call it whatever you want. Very nicely put. Uh, in terms of the Bitcoin price, a lot of people, it's crazy because when you started, you know, people would say 10K, 20K, and that'd be, what? That's crazy. Now people are saying 100K, 200K, 300K. Uh, and a lot of people are saying it's crazy, but it feels less crazy because Bitcoin has already had a massive bull run. What, what is your, I know, obviously you cannot see, you don't have a crystal ball, but do you think those are completely out of question, those six digit? predictions or i don't think any prediction is out of question if this experiment works um whether or not i would make a price prediction i'd absolutely not make a price prediction i don't care you don't care yeah. all i care about is one graph and that is the adoption graph yeah. how many people yeah. are actually using bitcoin crypto etc digital assets and what are they using them for mm -hmm. i think that unfortunately in this industry we're getting one thing half right we're getting one thing very right bringing in speculators. We're getting a second thing half right, and that is getting more people to own digital assets. Mm. The one place where we're not getting it right yet is getting people to use digital currencies for things without knowing that they're actually using digital currencies. And as an industry, we're not getting that right yet. But again, like I say, we're a very young industry. Mm. There's lots of work to do. My thesis is that we're entering wave two of blockchain. Wave one, I think, was in fact, let's call it wave three. Wave one was Bitcoin. Wave two was everything else that came with it. 
And then you've got wave three, which is where I think we're going now. And that's what I call the activation stage. Activation means activating communities to build cool shit and then getting users to activating users to use that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think we're going into now. And in that world, technology becomes more of a commodity. Like the number of TPS you can do and that doesn't really matter. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's inconsequential. That's really, I really like the, the phases. That's really interesting. Uh, when it comes to, so Bitcoin, you've also uh, talked about the BNB coin on your show and you know, the exchange tokens asset class has been extremely successful. The best performing with BNB, uh, HT token, and we have other exchange all tokens. Them. All of them, they've been really, really doing well. Why is that? Do you believe that there's real value since it's connected to discounts or, or why do you think that these exchange tokens have performed so well? So it's a combination of two things. One is that, like I said, we've got one thing very, very right, and that is getting people to be able to speculate on price. And the exchanges are the businesses that are the custodians of that price speculation. They did that very, very well. The second thing that exchanges managed to do very, very well was to create securities, blatant security. Exchange tokens are securities. And to avoid securities regulation and to give people value by burning the tokens. If there was no burning of the tokens, there'd be very little value to these tokens. And so I think they've managed, they've got this, they've Bitcoin is speculative and they've managed to create this non-security security and they've done it very well. And that's why we are where we are today. Yeah, that may, that's, I love that non-security security. It's a non-security security. Because it's very in the gray area, right? It's, it's really hard to- uh... Yes, I know legally it's not a security because they've had, they've spent a lot of money on lawyers and they've also listed them in certain jurisdictions, et cetera. But I mean, it, 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 20 percent of all our profits are burnt in tokens okay then it's a security mm -hmm. uh, yeah i'm sure the lawyers are much smarter than i am but you ask me why i think the exchanges have been successful that's why the exchanges have been successful very important to note in the first phase the only companies if i if i were to say to you today how many companies do you know that are in blockchain and crypto and actually making money and are not exchanges Oh my God, you put me on the spot. Because there are very few. Uh, you're right. In, I mean, there, there are, but there are yeah, very few and far between the, lending, the lending companies. Yeah, the lending. Yeah. But who, who was profitable first? Yeah. The exchanges. The exchanges, yeah. And now everybody else is starting to build. So I think phase one was exchanges. I think over time, exchanges are going to become less relevant and real blockchain businesses are going to start making money. That's really interesting. As you know, and speaking of like the exchanges that are successful, Ethereum has gained a lot of interest these days. Um, and you are really good at understanding crypto finance. Like a lot of people think, okay, I, I might want to get some Bitcoin, hopefully use it and not just speculate. But in a portfolio, do you see other asset classes are valuable? So we talked about exchange tokens, perhaps protocol tokens. Are there any other like asset classes or sub asset classes that you like? Crypto is a very weird asset class mm -hmm. because people refer to crypto as an asset class when in fact it's actually multiple asset classes. Yeah. So everyone, you know, in the traditional world, oh, crypto, yeah, we've got exposure to crypto asset class. But hold on, one is a store of value. The other one is a currency. The other one is effectively shares in an exchange. Yeah. masked into some <laughs> burning mechanism and the fourth one is value in certain networks you know uh, smart contract networks transaction networks uh, etc now each one of those is actually a different asset class mm -hmm. and i mean there's other asset classes like security tokens nfts etc um but each one of those is a different asset class so i think the idea is if you want to build a diversified portfolio of crypto assets which i think everybody in the space should be doing. Um, I'm not one of these people that believe you should just hold Bitcoin or just hold Ethereum. I think you should decide which industries you believe are going to be disrupted by blockchain. Decide how soon and how high the probability is of disruption and then decide specifically on which ones you want to invest. And that's how it's structured. Mm, nice structure. That's really cool. Because a lot of people say the gaming industry is going to be huge. The, the, the world of the future is between virtual and real. And If you uh, think that <laughs> if that's your, your thesis, go ahead. There's, there's great gaming tokens. I mean, you know, there's Wax token. There's a whole lot of other tokens which are great for people who believe that gaming and is going to take over the world. Yeah. Do it. If, you're not, if you don't believe gaming is going to be, be it, then... By the DeFi tokens. DeFi tokens, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's one really interesting. Obviously, we had Ton, the Telegram 
uh, but also in Japan, there's Line that's creating their token in these messaging apps, uh, which, which you know, for example, Line has 60 million users in Japan, which is already six times what Coinbase may have. Do you think messaging apps yes. have a real use case for these tokens? So full disclaimer, I am an investor in Telegram. Um, I believe that a messaging app is the best chance that we've got of getting crypto adoption. Like if you can imagine people over WeChat send money regularly. We don't do it yet in the West, but in the East sending money over a messenger is, is that's how things work. Now, I really thought that Telegram was going to be the first one. Obviously the SEC has put a, a roadblock up for them and you know, we'll see in a couple of days, weeks, months, what happens. Um, but I think messenger apps need to have that, that, that functionality. Think about it like this. It's not about sending money from me to you. That's one thing, but you can make the whole app very transactive in terms of you can start shops and you can start selling things over messengers via smart contracts. Um, you know, you can start doing loans over messenger apps via smart contracts. You know, when you start to open that door and you've got 250 million users, 300 million users, 500 million users, and all of a sudden there's a new button that says, hey, buy dollars or buy crypto, not calling it crypto, or buy grams or whatever it is, then it's like, wow, hold on, this, this, this is, that in my mind is the best chance. The problem is that the SEC has now three times come in the way. The first one was the Keen, Keen Kick uh, some, uh, Messenger, where you know, the, the SEC came and effectively bullied them yeah. into surrendering. They tried to bully Telegram, but Telegram's fighting back, and they're bullying Facebook. Because yeah. you know, I think one of the things that Facebook certainly was going to do was allow people to send money across their various messaging platforms. But the SEC came and effectively stopped that. But does that make sense? Because, you know, like, like you said, these messaging apps have a huge, huge usage and actual adoption. Like we're saying 60 million, 100 million, 150 million. Are they just scared? It arrives at a scale where it's starting to threaten the banks or the central banks. And that's why they're, they're suddenly reacting to this. I think so. I also think that you know, the SEC has a, a specific role and there's this FINRA that has another specific role and everybody wants their piece of this new unregulated instrument. Mm. You know, everybody is, is, is trying, the CFTC, the, 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 the SEC, FINRA, everybody wants a, a piece of this crypto pie. Mm. And so, look, I think that unfortunately, because of the mentality in the US specifically, the US is losing out on a lot. I think as a result, I think Korea is going to, is taking off, Japan's taking off. Uh, I think that China is going to even beat the US. And I think it's very sad. But, you know, I think that's the mentality of the US. The US is uh, over regulated and over enforced. And this is a pretty new thing. I think it's mainly since 9 uh, 11 that this over regulation and over enforcement started. Um, and I think, unfortunately, in this case, it's really hampering innovation. And I think it's going to, I think the US is going to lose its, pow its technological powerhouse status because. Everyone that I know is moving their companies outside of the US. Mm. They're too heavily taxed. They're too heavily scrutinized. I mean, I moved to the US last year in April. And I don't know if you watched the Facebook hearings, you know, the Mark Zuckerberg yeah, and the David Marcus hearings. Yeah, yeah. You know, as someone who now lives in the US, I was embarrassed. Like to hear the questions that those senators were asking, oh how many women are going to be in the foundation? That's a very relevant question, but not about that. And, you know, how are we standing up for LGBTQ rights? Which is, again, a relevant question, but is that, you know, everyone came there to drive an agenda. And what they were showing the world is we are not this land of the free, a land of innovation, a land of entrepreneurs. In fact, if you come to the U.S., you will be scrutinized more than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. So don't come to the U.S. And I think it's really sad, but, you know, the, U the U.S. must live with their own decisions. It was crazy. I remember there's one question, how do you monetize Facebook or something like that? I was like, oh my God, did you just ask that at a hearing? <laughs> the general level of questions was extremely embarrassing. Uh, I watched it a few times, just it was either that or watch comedy on TV and I just thought that that was funnier. So, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true we should watch that just to laugh you know I did, yeah. Meltem she kicked butt though during the hearings right she yeah we, really good we job. had some good ambassadors Meltem Meltem is a great ambassador for the space she's she's really one of the smartest people in the space oh, again one of the great people that I met on my encounters at CNBC 
And speaking of Meltem, and actually the panel that you just had here, uh, Meltem, she had this talk, and I believe it was in Singapore, and I believe you were there. Do you remember the toilet? It's in, it was in a Magical Crypto Conference, and it was last year in yeah. May. <laughs> and you covered it, right? And I covered it in the toilet, <laughs> and we threw shit coins down the toilet. Meltem is amazing. Um, she's very solid. She, um, she's, she's really amazing. She's a real asset to the space, really one of the, the good people in the space. I believe so, too. She's yeah. so switched on, and, and she really represents us to, to the fullest. Uh, thank you so much, Meltem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but in talking about shit coins, and that was so funny. You mentioned on the panel right here, it's so funny. You were extremely cool and calculated and composed, and all of a sudden, what about shit coins? And everyone kind of laughed in the <laughs> audience. That was really, really funny. Um, in terms of shit coins and, and this definition, um, what, how would you define it as of today? And do you think that 2019 and 2020 will be better years to understand, you know, who's the more valuable project? And There are a lot of sh shit coins out there. Um, coins that never had a good thesis, will never have a good thesis um, and can never work. Um, and people who invested in those coins in the beginning, you know, that if you want to get into a game that's unregulated in the early days, then you better know what you're doing. And if you don't, that's your, your own fault. Um, I know a lot of them were experiments. Uh, I invested in a lot of them. I worked alongside a lot of them. And we now realize that those theses could never, ever work. I say again, I'm all about, in this space, experimentation. But experimentation with honesty and integrity in place. So if you go out and raise money in full transparency, with a full business plan and a full white paper and you raise the money in good faith and you work hard and it fails, then respect. Because I think that those are the experiments, you know, you, when you're going into a new world where no one's ever been, you're going to fail nine times. But the 10th time when you succeed, you're going to change the world. So as long as you go out there with transparency, honesty, integrity, uh, accountability, you know, my view now, and specifically every project that I work with now, regardless of whether it's regulated or unregulated, I insist that my projects publish financials and make them transparent. Mm -hmm. How much crypto have you burned? How much salary is a team earning? It must be transparent. Even though you have no accountability legally, you have an ethical accountability and you have to, you have, to have the integrity. And for me, if a, if a project won't publish its financials, I'd rather not get involved. So, so even if the token has awesome utility, but you can't see the financials, you won't get involved. If it's if there's a centralized team or a foundation, mm -hmm. I think that they have a uh, they have an obligation. Maybe not a legal a moral, obligation. Yeah. It's a moral obligation, moral obligation because yeah. legally we've said that we can't do this because if you do, it, it's a security. Yeah. But there's a moral obligation. I mean, I worked with a team. I flew last year to meet a team in Hong Kong. I'm not going to mention their names because I think they've had enough problems as it is. I flew to Hong Kong to meet them, and they asked me to work with them. And I said, you know, how much money did you raise? And they said, we raised 30 million. I said, how much is left? They said, 3 million. I said, okay, there's 27 million gone, which is possible, um, but not probable. And I said, all right, well, are you willing to have an audit so that you can show your investors and your token holders how much money you burnt? And I said, no, we're not willing to have an audit. And that, that was really the end of the meeting. Because for me to get in, again, I believe that we're in a very risky space. And I believe that unfortunately, most investors in the space don't have the expertise to evaluate the quality of the crypto. I don't think many people do. And so with that in mind, the last thing that you can afford is, is not to be transparent mm -hmm. because then you, you, you risk being labeled a scam or a shitcoin or whatever else. Yeah. But that said, I am very much for experimentation. That's fantastic. And for experimentation, like, you know how Tom Lee tends to say, like, you know, to traditional guys, put one, 2% of your portfolio uh, risk on, risk off, et cetera, et cetera. Do, do you kind of have that uh, same mindset as only one or 2% or do you believe in it to the point where you're, you're willing to allocate a bit, a bit more? Because I work in it every day and I'm exposed to it every day, obviously a lot of my net wealth actually sits in crypto today in some form or another, um, whether it's, you know, shares or tokens and companies that I'm working with. Um, I think if you're ignorant and you want exposure, your best bet is to just put your money into Bitcoin. Bitcoin yeah. If you want to take a bit more risk, then you know build yourself a, an index. If you want to take another level of risk, go into a managed fund. Go into there's there's good managed funds in the space. Um, you know people like Multicoin Capital and you know uh, Polychain, Pantera. Those are all good managed funds. Get yourself into one of those managed funds and forget about it. Um, 
I really don't believe what's happening in the space of these, you know, people looking for the next Bitcoin and losing a lot of money. We lost them in 2017. And I think, unfortunately, what's happening is they're coming back yeah. because they're seeing the quick price rises here. Mm. And I think, again, that's very unhealthy for the industry. It's going to only do damage. They're going to get burnt. They're going to lose money. They're going to invest in scams. They're going to invest in things that can never work. Um, and they're not going to come back. You know, shame on you if you fool me once, shame on me if you fool me twice. But the third time, it's shame on everyone. Yeah, that's a really good point. And speaking of the, the frequency of trading, obviously, CNBC crypto trader it has trading. And I know on your show, you asked many people, do you huddle, do you trade? And what's the frequency and stuff like that? But, um, you know, many people are just saying huddle, huddle, huddle. But then the traders say, no, are you kidding me? With this volatility, this is like going into a candy store. You can enjoy the trade. If you're a trader, then you'll trade anything. You know, I have a, I have a friend who's a, who's a trader. And, you know, he'll, he'll trade the price of potatoes if he can. So it's like, if you're a trader, then, then any asset that moves up and down is great for you. And crypto, because of its lack of liquidity, moves up and down a hell of a lot. Yeah. Um, but if you're an investor, do it in a mature, responsible way. And I think, of, yeah, I'm very much pro the managed fund approach or the passive index oh, approach. Passive index yeah. approach. That makes a lot of sense. In 2020, well, obviously, we had a bit of a correction. You, you were telling me uncorrelated still, but there's correlation, but is it really a non-correlated asset? In terms of 2020 and the years to come, like what are the things that you really want to see? Things that we're struggling with, basically the Superman's kryptonite. Adoption. Adoption. Activation. So for me, it's very simple. Right now you have two chains that are really working. Bitcoin, and when I say working from a community point of view in Ethereum. Now, one thesis is that it will just remain Bitcoin and Ethereum because Ethereum has attracted all the, the, um, the developer community and thereby, thereby all the funding community is always on the back of Bitcoin or Ethereum. Mm -hmm. But there's still an opportunity for other chains and other protocols to emerge. But it means building a community. Most of these, most of these technologists don't know how to build a community. They built the best tech. I guarantee you that if you go out today with a technological eye only, you'll find much better smart contract platforms than Ethereum. Mm. But no one's building on them. And so you have to get people to adopt the chain and then we have to go for consumer adoption. So adopt chains. Consumer adoption for me is a function of getting consumers to use crypto in fun ways, not knowing that it's crypto. Mm. Don't mention the word crypto. Don't mention the word um, 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 private keys or seed phrases. Just find a way that people can swap Ronaldinho and Ronaldo and, and Messi cards, you know, uh, NFTs without knowing that they're NFTs. Mm, that is so true. That is, that is a really good way to look at it. I, I love the, the fact, yeah. That, that, that. And speaking of NFTs and security like tokens, it's something that you talked about on the panel as well. Sorry, you just gave me that idea and I was thinking with it, talking about the future. And uh, you asked the, the actual panelists, you know, about security tokens and NFTs. Do you see that as a, as a big space moving sure. forward or? Sure. I think. Again, the blockchain community is maybe not seeing this correctly. All the work that I'm seeing around securities tokens today is around taking equity and making it blockchain equity tokens. Equity is like quite a cool instrument. It works pretty well. I don't think it needs to be decentralized. And I think blockchain is a very expensive way of doing it, albeit that it does have some advantages. We should be creating new instruments. Um, I give the example of two great examples. One is a, a shipping company. You know, they can either raise equity to fund a bunch of ships or they can raise a new instrument, which is a smart contract instrument, which says nautical, nautical miles times weight of the ship paid a dollar dividend for every nautical mile that has traveled per, per kilogram or per ton or whatever it is. And then that's a smart contract. It's a security because it's, it falls under securities law, but it's a smart contract and it's really innovative. And I'll give you another example. Imagine that you could invest in these bird and lime scooters, crowdfund them. And imagine that every time that they were activated using a token, the smart contract would pay you a dollar. That's a very cool security. That is really cool. And then I'll, I'll give you a third one. What if you could own a security token that gave you 10 cents for every juice that was poured out of the McDonald's juice fountain anywhere in the world? And you could buy just that security. Those are cool instruments, which users can easily understand, and they're not equity. They break us away from this mentality of, mentality of equity. 
And for me, that's the world of securities tokens, not getting equity on the blockchain. We don't need equity on the blockchain. We have great equity not on the blockchain and it works pretty well. That is fascinating. I never thought about that, but it, you're right. It creates a whole incentivized model and it's something that, you know, if you believe in, you can see people using it. It just makes a lot of sense on a product level necessarily, like you said, on a specific level rather than betting on an entire company. We can break down entire business functions. Yeah. I mean, you can invest in an aircraft and you could get, you could buy a token for every time that somebody sits in a seat, you get a percentage through a smart contract. You're not betting on airline management. You're, you're, you're not, you can even bet on just a certain route. Mm -hmm. Now, all, those, all these things are now becoming available because of smart contracts and because of, of uh, digital token technology. And it really sounds like because a lot of people say that the Bitcoin maxis usually say, you know, everyone is trying to, they see them as competition because they think everyone's trying to be money. But that sounds kind of like rewards, membership points, loyalty points, some sort of different model, then it's not all money, right? There are a bunch of Bitcoin maximalists. And, you know, unfortunately for them, all they see is Bitcoin, 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 decentralized money. Um, and then there's a bunch of people who believe in experimentation. And for me, I'm, I fall, I know Bitcoin is working. I'm also looking to experiment and do cool shit using the blockchain. That's what we want. Cool shit doing the blockchain. But you're right. Experimentation is definitely something that's amazing. And Ryan, you've been an amazing guest. And thank you so much. First and foremost, like I said in the very beginning, for your contribution through CNBC Crypto Trader, really like connecting the traditional world with the crypto world. Like people don't realize how important this is to, to really go through mass adoption. So thank you so much. If we want thank to contact you. you, where are you the most active these days? Is it so Twitter? I think, think Twitter is probably the best at Crypto Man Run on Twitter. Um, uh, yeah, I, I try and respond as much as I can. Ran, you're the man. Thank, Thank you so you. much for everything, guys. And if you like this video, don't forget to smash that like button, blast the bell notification, put your comments below. Ran will probably too, be too busy to respond, but we can get the discussion going on in the comments and, and learn from each other. So thank you so much, guys, for watching. Don't forget that we premiere every Wednesday, 8 o'clock GMT at a computer near you. See you next week, guys.